let me introduce the panelists to you. On my right is Mark McKenzie. Mark is one of two founders of SWV, a privately owned consultancy and market research company specializing in the eyewear and eye care industry. Mark was formerly International Business Development Director for the Ophthalmic Division of Carl Zeiss Vision. Before this, he was a Vice President of Solar Inc., responsible for the European region. His experience in the ophthalmic industry followed a career in consumer goods marketing at L'Oreal and Target. And before this, he studied at INSEED in Fontainebleau. On my left is uh, George Mayer. He's director and head of international lab support for Rodenstock. George is head of, uh, he reports to the board. He is responsible for the operational support of more than 30 RX labs producing Rodenstock brand under license worldwide. Before that, he was involved in international projects of the Engineering Center of Rodenstock. In previous positions, he has worked as Divisional Director for Carl Zeiss Vision South Africa, BTY, and as RX Consultant for subsidiaries and distribution partners in 13 countries for Optish work, G. Rodenstock. George has studied optical engineering at Cologne Institute of Technology and general business management at Gewerbeschule in Bad Urach. I hope I pronounced that. It couldn't be better. <laughs> And on the uh, extreme left is Devon Ablett, who is Technical Operations Team Manager and Director of Business Development for Quantum Innovations. Devon is an experienced electromechanical service engineer with a decades-long background in information technology. In June 2019, he was named Director of Business Development at Quantum Innovations, Inc., where he focuses on global business development and strengthened customer relations. As of 2020, Devon also oversees the Technical Operations Department at Quantum Innovations. Service at Quantum Innovations 20 to 2012, 2012, sorry. Present, he's headquartered in Southern Oregon in the USA. Quantum Innovations has specialized in thin film coating technology and support for the ophthalmic industry since 2002. Now I'm going to open the panel discussion by asking each of the panel members to voice their opinions on specific topics based upon their particular expertise. After the three panel members have spoken, I will throw the floor open to allow you to ask any questions or make any comments which have crossed your mind. If you would like to ask any specific panel member, please begin by stating who you would like to answer the question first. I would like to begin with the first question to Mark McKenzie. Mark, I know that you keep an ear close to the ground with all aspects of ophthalmic optics. Can you give us your opinion as to what changes on the retail side of the profession will have the most impact and influence on the manufacturing side. Mark? I think you can hear me okay? Yeah, I think there'll be two changes. One 
concerning developing markets, and by developing markets, I'm talking about economies where the GDP per capita is probably $15,000 per head or lower, and the other one in developed markets, which is over $15,000 per capita. In developing markets, we're seeing a growth in optical outlets. We recently did a study in, for the year 2021. We saw quite a considerable number of new optical outlets in various countries of the world. And we looked at that a bit more, in more, a bit more detail, you know, where are these optical outlets coming from? They seem partly to be coming from people who are working for an employer and have decided to set up on their own. There's some people who have come in from industries or markets outside of optics because they found out that you can make a very good margin on selling eyewear. And I think that's important because if you look at the develop, uh, the, the map of Asia Pacific, and you just look at that part of the world, well, about 42, 43% of all lenses sold worldwide are now sold there. And that's going to go up to close to 50% by the year 2030. Now, not all Asian countries are developing markets. I mean, you know, you have Japan, which is a highly developed market, but actually the factor of Japan is market volume is flat. So the, you're going to see growth in volumes coming from developing markets, coming from outlets which have perhaps a very basic level of training. Now, I was watching the presentations this morning, and I thought, Craig, this is fantastic, but how does this actually fit in with the, the end consumer, well, the person you're sending the lenses to in developing markets? So I think here one needs to give thought maybe to not just having a sales force going out and selling lenses and saying, look, my lens has this and this benefit, but also, as some people are doing, educating people in the outlets. If you now switch to the developed markets, over $15,000 per year, I see in certain countries, you know, they buy them OCTs. Now, OCTs cost a lot of money, and they're buying these pieces of equipment. And in, in the UK, we have a, what I think is a good system. Services are charged for, and it is an accepted part of the optical retail profession. In many markets, services are not charged for. I don't think we will just be able just well just put another 50 or 100 euros on the price of a progressive to cover these charges because at some stage when the progressive is going over seven eight hundred euros for a pair and remember you're always buying a length frame on top of it people won't be able to pay for it and i think we will see a trend like we're seeing in norway to charge for optical services as a separate thing. And I think the challenge for you manufacturers in RX Lab is how do you take a piece of that cake? Because at the moment, it's not coming to your pockets. I think those are the two. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. George, next. What are the most exciting new technologies relating to quality assurance of spectacle lenses, which will have an impact going forward on the manufacturing side? Yes, I mean, I think we've come a long way from manual vitrometers, which I st started my, when I started my professional career in ophthalmic, was the standard. And uh, most of that lens making measurements, as it was said by Daniel and Thomas, is very well covered. We know the optic power, we know everything physically on the lens, where really the excitement starts, and that's also back to the last presentation, is that we are starting now with these systems to be able to look at lenses, not only through the lens. Because the, the error of um, margin in handling manually lenses which come out of a digital production completely controlled now into manual batching, into dip coating, uh, checking in a wet stage after dip coating, handling into the ovens, out of the ovens, into the possible ultrasonic cleaning, from ultrasonic, again into ring, into dome, flipping, nightmare, out again. And then finally, those 
possible defects which come through the manual operators, we either have to automate the lines fully, like some of the suppliers are trying, um, or we have to automate the control. And my hope is that um, the development goes into that direction, that we not only have the physical inspection through, but we are we're living all of the features of the lens, basically sometimes more than on the lens making, the coating, the add-ons, the tins, the features. And for those purposes, we need systems which can, phase three of the previous presentation, look at our X lenses, both surfaces, check if the coatings are defect-free, uh, spit marks, fibers, whatever is on there, which the current systems, to my knowledge, do not cover. So for me, the circle of automated measurement of RX lenses is only complete when this step is also included. Because um, as a premium lens supplier being in that segment, which Mark just mentioned, um, the cosmetic is becoming even more important than in the commodity or entry and entry segment. So I'm really excited seeing our developments going in that direction, which will help us really um, Labor cost is one part of it, um, but the other effect is, of course, the inconsistency of um, you have three shifts of, of control people. Each shift consists of 20, 30, 40 people looking at lenses, and you've got five seconds for wide label, 10 seconds for brand. And uh, in the morning, they are more strict. In the evening, they're tired. I mean, we heard that all in, in the various presentations, and there was a lot of truth in it. So. For me, it has not only the consequence of, of labor cost, but also of consistency and getting the right quality at the right level to that particular customer. And once we have automated that, and then with the addition of AI, I mean, it becomes endless. It will work both ways, forward towards the client, but also backward into the SPC systems in production. So the input we can get from a full and final Cosmetic inspection helps us all tremendously. So I'm really excited about that development. Thank you, George. Finally, Devon, what are the most exciting new technologies relating to lens coatings which will have an impact on spectral lens technology? Yeah, I think uh, I think a big portion of uh, what we're seeing today is that people are developing more than uh, a classic uh, thin film coating or that there are uh, additions to thick film coatings that we haven't seen in the past uh, that perform some of the duties that we've expected out of a thin film coating in the past. Uh, and so you're able to uh, double up on some of those. Uh, perhaps you can get uh, for the markets where that's important, blue light, uh, uh, blocking out of uh, thick film coating uh, that you used to have to uh, depend on the lens monomer for. Um, or and there are a number of companies who are developing uh, interesting uh, AR, uh, or sorry, clarify anti-reflective coatings uh, and, and otherwise mirror coatings or absorption coatings um, that do more than just get a little bit more light to the lens or to your eye rather. Um, that's uh, that I think is uh, the exciting aspect. If you're able to educate the consumer, uh, which I think is a big portion, especially in the US uh, where uh, AR uptake is very low um, as it is compared to the rest of the world, uh, they can start to see the benefits of those and that, hey, this is not just a, um, uh, this isn't just an add-on, it's a necessary part of the entire spectacle package. So, uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of interesting designs that come out that aren't just, hey, is this a green or blue coating? Is there a small amount of uh, residual color to it? Uh, there's, uh, there's a bunch of things coming out in the next few years that I think will be ex exciting that way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open to you to ask any panel member a question. Question to Devon. Uh, why is the AR coating market so low still in US? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I think it has a lot to do with the education of the average consumer uh, that's buying spectacles in the US. Um, 
generally speaking, that is a fashion forward item. Uh, they're buying it because it's got the right name on, this, on the frame. Uh, the lens aspect of it and the medical portion of it are a secondary effect. Uh, most of it is driven by insurance in the U.S. Uh, they're, they're not going out paying for this out of pocket. Uh, a lot of the times they're waiting for their insurance to re-up and there's certain values that are in that. Um, if they're already buying, they've already spent most of the money uh, of their uh, allowance, I suppose, on the frame, uh, and that was expensive, then they're going to get whatever the cheapest lens is they can put in. And if they have to spend another 70 or $80 for a anti-glare coating, uh, which is how it's typically pitched, that's, that's a hard sell. Uh, there, you could ask the average, uh, the average employee at an ECP uh, in, uh, in the US, hey, what do I get for that $80? Oh, well, I mean, it'll reduce the glare on the lens. Is that it? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, what, what, uh, what's the color do? Well, it, you can get it in green or blue, but what's the difference? There isn't any difference, it's just green or blue. Um, and, and so that's, that's actually fairly common. Uh, it's unfortunate, but the consumer is not educated in whether there's a benefit or not. Uh, what they're educated in is that I got a really cool frame. Uh, and if the lenses last, you know, a year, I'm gonna get another pair next year. So, uh, yeah, it's the convincing them uh, in a very short window of time by people who aren't trying uh, to spend an extra eighty or eighty dollars, usually on average, yeah, maybe more. Yeah. Good question. So we could see some initiative from uh, very big tech companies going into optics you know, with VR and AR. It, it might take some time, but they're big, they have quite a lot of money, um, and it might create some changes in the industry. Um, what, what is your perspective on those potential changes? How do you see, I don't know, those two work going together? What's your opinion and view where this is going? So, is it clear? <laughs> Who wants to pitch? I can. Yeah. Um, one of the subjects you're talking about, presumably, is smart glasses. Yeah. yeah. Before I talk about smart glasses, let's just come back to the, the main product we as an industry sell. We sell single vision lenses. Yeah. About, if you look at the world consumption, they're more than a third of all lenses are progressives. The rest are single vision with a bit of bifocal. Bifocal lenses sell on average for five euros a lens, on average. Huh? It goes down to $2, to $2 for a 1.5 hard-coated lens. We won't just increase progressives into infinity. We won't, I don't think we'll, even if I come to this conference for many years, I don't think we'll see 50% of all lenses in the world sold being progressives. So we've got to do something with single vision. I think smart eyewear fits into that picture. If you look at what manufacturers are doing today, they're pushing higher price single vision. It's the so-called digital single vision lenses, which are for young presbyopes to help with accommodation. When you're looking at digital devices, you've got a lot of energy being poked up into myopia control lenses, but that probably won't be enough. I think smart eyewear, as it's called, has now come into a price range which is affordable. Ray-Ban stories cost $400. Okay, tick over $400. And Ray-Ban stories, you can use it as a phone, you can pick up messages, you can listen to music, and it'll project data onto the inside of your screen. And I think that we will see moves by large ophthalmic lens manufacturers to invigorate the single vision segment through the use of smart eyewear. 
So I believe that it will be a segment, even though it failed, you know, you could say it failed in 2015, Facebook took their product off the market. I believe it will be a success, but, you know, there's other people who say, Mark, no, come on, rubbish. You know, it's just a fad. I think it will be a success. Um, I think the factors are appeal. The, the frames are becoming more appealing now. The price point's coming into line, and some people will find a use of it. So yes, I do. I, I, see, um, I see that as a danger to the traditional manufacturers, if you're not in it. Luxottica is. Huh? Luxottica has teamed up with Meta, and they're working together. Um, and I think it's probably an idea of this, you know, for other manufacturers to do the same thing. They probably are, though, Georg. We had it too early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wrong time. Does that answer part of your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Um, and do you, do you see some kind of uh, collaboration between those big tech companies and big lens manufacturing companies? Or it could, I you know, get some other type of, um, I mean, would you see it as collaborations or something different maybe? But well, you're probably asking the wrong person because I'm a consultant. I just consult in these companies. But um, I think that if they don't collaborate and if this segment does take off, well, then, heck, at the end of the day, you don't have to be a genius to develop a single vision of thalmic lens. I, I understand that one of the problems is getting the electronics into the lens easy to do with 3D printing, but less easy to do unless you have um, lam laminated layers containing the electrical components. But let me say to you, I hate sat-navs and I hate television screens on the dashboard of motor cars. And I also hate the concept of being able to look in the corner of my spectacle lens and read there that there's a big traffic jam somewhere ahead. And, and the reason for the jam is blah, 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 blah. And I'm looking up there, very difficult for the eyes to do, as a matter of fact. And I'm not concentrating on the road. And that's really why I, I see a great danger in, in using these sat -navs you know it only takes a second to take your attention off the road um, and something drastic to happen. Yeah, a question that can go to anybody of you, uh, because uh, talking about uh, smart lenses, I was thinking that uh, because of our energy crisis and the cost of energy that is uh, rising to the sky, a uh, lot of cities are uh, reducing the city lights. So what about uh, night vision for lenses? Well, uh, I think there's a... Uh, are you talking about uh, night vision in the traditional sense, like I can see in pitch black, or just in oh, yeah, well, that's that's an interesting. I suppose that would come with, yeah, yeah. I suppose that would just come with uh, um, the up the uptake of smart glasses in general. It wouldn't be hard then to put a camera on there that can see in the IR range and then project that as augmented reality in front of you. Uh, you know, as a in my in my mind, it's the the first version of like a really good smart glass setup isn't going to be like uh, like Google Glass was. That's a that's a neat idea, and it it probably was before its time. The technology is just not there, but it's going to have to fit into something that's more attractive than a big chunky frame, which is going to be hard uh, until you can get the battery to not be a big chunky thing, and it almost has to sort of project it. Uh, a little bit in front of you, not where you're sort of craning your eye to look in a in a different direction. But I could see, yeah. And uh, once you get to that point where it's just sort of projecting things in your normal field of vision, why not? Yeah. So, I, it, but in terms of just being able to put a coating on the lens, yeah, probably no. <laughs> Hi, 
I have a question for George. You mentioned that cosmetic measurement is, you, in your opinion, a key technology you would like to have in all the labs. My question is, um, many people say, okay, if you have a measurement device which detects defects, it creates breakage. It's not producing lenses. So this means if you sell such a machine, this machine you have to pay. So your labs, for example, have to order such a machine and has to pay for it. So do you think that they are one to pay or willing to pay more money than what they have now with a manual inspection? Is this really something which has a real value for the lab where they want to invest? I, I think it certainly has a has a cost impact right away. Looking at the investment return on investment, um, and and the uh, the depreciation of the cost versus the labor cost over the same time, and even if you can cover only eighty percent of the the cases and you reduce the checking staff from from one hundred percent to twenty percent, um, but it, it also, if you can give the right quality to the, to the customer where the level is agreed on, I think it will also have an impact on, on, on breakage returns and, and those things. So I'm pretty convinced when we can do that and it can replace in the case of blank measurement exactly what the um, manual labor has done on a consistent level, then it's ju just a matter of, of our ROI basically. Do I invest for two years before I have it back or three years? But just the consistency and, and the knowledge of data to get out of there um, would probably pay off, I think. Thank you. Just uh, if I may add, I mean, if that manual department, that, that voodoo box, dip coating, vacuum coating, and especially tinting, if that once gets digitalized as we manage in the surfacing process, then this problem might change at the back end. Because at the end of our X inspection, if you have good first pass yield, there's hardly anything to find. And there are the tools which you have already provided in the industry are sufficient. It's just the manual, if you can take that away, my answer will change. In our experience, the at least in, in, in many labs or many products, the main causes for breakage are uh, from coatings and from cosmetic aspects. Yeah. And I think one of the big savings could be also helping the troubleshooting and the root cause analysis, because what we hear is it's a very complex process, very time consuming. When everything's going great, it's great. But when there is a problem, there's a lot of time lost on the lines and, and troubleshooting and recovering. And a combination of full quality measurement with everything in the lens, plus all these systems for data management, uh, helping with uh, troubleshooting root cause analysis, at, at least for me, as in, in a sense, also a lens maker, would be one of the main uh, advantages. No? Yeah. Fully agree. That would be the, the lab of the future. Yeah. Fully digitalized, data based. Um, hardly any manual um, interference and consistent in each quality level which the market needs for the different purposes. Question for the panel in general. What do you think about online sales of eyewear and where it's going to go in the future? <laughs> okay, I thought I'd be caught with that one. Online sales. Online sales and contact lenses started in about 1997 in Sweden. Um, the first time we picked up online sales of spectacles was about 2007. So online sales have been around now for 15 years. It's not a new thing. We see two basic trends. Uh, there's no doubt about it in the UK, online sales have definitely achieved Seven, about 7% 7 of all lenses sold are online now. Now, out of that 7%, about 3% are value share. So it's 7% volume, 3% value share. If you look at what's sold in the UK, it tends to be glasses direct. Great offers at £45 for a single pair of single vision lenses in a frame. 
The, U, um, the U.S., there's a lot of argument about what the real figure is in the U.S., and the Vision Council just opened, presented new figures showing that the online segment is much bigger than they thought it was in the past. I'm very cautious when I look at those figures because you have to determine what is online. To my mind, online is you're sitting here in this conference room, you get bored with the discussion, you choose a frame, you put it into your laptop, and you send it off um, to Glasses Direct uh, in Berlin, oh, no, so, uh, Berlin D in Berlin, and it gets delivered to your flat uh, when you get back home. Now, that's definitely online, because you've done everything online, but there's also an element of you can go into a shop for a fitting. That, as long as the bill is paid by you over the internet, then I believe that is online because then the relationship is between you, the customer, and the online company. And I think when you start taking that much more rigorous approach to online, the numbers come down. The online percentage in France is half a percent. That's fair about the half a percent. In Germany, depending on you know, what figures you look at, okay, it's about three to four percent in value. I think if you say online can go to 10, then yes. But there's an awful lot of people who say, well, online is going to be 20% of the future, and I don't, I don't see this happening. If I may say, I had um, two, two indicators what that could be in the future. Um, I got three daughters between 20 and 30, and I had to manhandle them not to order their next single vision glasses online, working at Rodenstock. So. I think it will shift a lot with the, with the generation's attitude to online business. The second is that um, what I heard last from, from my friends and colleagues in Canada and North America is that they really prepare for about 20% uh, online sales. And the third indicator is one of our big biggest clients, uh, kind of chain group. Um, they were threatened by Amazon Prime promising you can have your specs the next day. And uh, they also mention a number of about 15, 20% possible market share. But I agree with Mark, it will differ very much from market to market. Uh, thank you for everything of today. Uh, I just would like to know, is the 3D printing uh, is a new threat that will replace the current uh, technology of manufacturing lenses in the coming five years, let's say. Thanks. Did you take that one? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I was at Lux Excel in their founding phase, and I was very close to them until now recently they uh, took up a big partnership. So. For me, as an, as an engineer, it's fascinating to print lenses and, and also the possibilities with smart glasses embedding functional layers. Uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. And it might help a bit with the smart glasses in the single vision segment. But from a pricing point of view, if it's not an extreme prescription, a, a, a doorstopper wedge or a, a, something really extraordinary, I don't see that the system can compete with the level of, of pricing and quality uh, which we have in the general um, RX lab offerings. My, my understanding of the um, progression of 3D printing, perhaps Francois, you can answer, is to do with the not having a suitable monomer. Exactly. And this is really what's holding it back. Exactly, because it needs to be fluid enough to get through the nozzles and still needs to be, uh, once in solid form, hard enough in order to uh, not be distorted by the, the, the heat and UV. So, no, it's not existing really. There's one index at the moment and it's not like 3D printing, you see it in the technical fields where you can watch as it grows. There's Pico droplets so light that they have to be absolutely in, in, in smooth air that they can slowly sink down onto the surface for the next layer. Mm -hmm. And still the final product has to be hard coated, otherwise it's still too rough. 
So it takes an awful long of time. Of course, you could multiply the machines, but the cost of the machines, the cost of the process, the limitations of the process, and somehow you have to have to start with a plain surface and then somehow get the lens together. I don't see it really being a, a mass product anywhere soon. But still, it could be used to uh, apply some, some coatings, like uh, photochromic, like uh, art coating and, and things like that. There are projects on that, yes. Yeah, I think it's a neat idea, but the technology is just still too far off. The, the number of materials uh, that need to be developed and the, the level of automation that would need to be developed to make it uh, you know, cost effective, it's, it doesn't feel like it's 10 years away. It feels much further than that. So. Perhaps I can just say a word or two about education for the next few years. I think you're all aware that optometrists who are very important customers of yours, of course, in the long run, they are moving towards medicine and away from optics. In, in the UK, as somebody has said, everybody has an OCT. And part of the reason why they're having to buy it is so that they can compete with their neighbor who also has an OCT. So they're, they're get, getting more and more sophisticated equipment in. And at the same time, since they, they want to become more paramedical, they are leaving optics and dispensing behind. And I can see a time when the UK dispensing optician will be doing the refraction. The, ophthalm, the optometrist will be looking at, at things like uh, um, light glaucoma detection and uh, a macular degeneration and all these, all these other um, awful diseases. So I think you should be aware of that because certainly in the UK, most of the major companies are not bothering to advertise to optometrists as much as to dispensing opticians. And because the technology is getting easier, the, um, we, we've got a new group of people called clinical assistants who are not trained in optics, but they're, they're trained in um, frame selection and, and, uh, and, and marketing lenses and believing what the magazines say about the lenses. I must say that some lens manufacturers are very naughty in the adverts that they put out. I've recently read one that claims that with a new progressive lens that they're marketing, in fact, this is in India, it has perfect vision at 7,225 points on the lens. In other words, all over the lens, perfect vision. So these pictures we've seen of um, performance of progressive lenses by people who know what they're talking about, as, as far as this um, company is concerned, they, they, they're unaware of it, I suspect. Actually, depending also on the size of the points, if the points are then we could square. <laughs> <laughs> the points are very small, you can fit them into the area. That's, yeah. ne needless to say, they don't mention that. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the beauty of marketing is that you can you can say a lot of things and fit it into a very narrow box that nobody ever really asks about. So, yeah. Fine. Well, I, I think the uh, the questions are running out. So I, I'd like to thank the panelists for um, setting themselves up as Aunt Sally's, so to speak. Well done, gentlemen. Very well. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to thank all the speakers today. Um, I, I found it very, very interesting to look into the future and future equipment that, that is coming through. 
And also, I think I'd like to say thank you to the organizers, to, to Hannah and Rebecca and their teams for um, making the conference, or let it, making it exist to begin with, and then letting it run so smoothly.